Good evening. Uh, you're coming to, hopefully coming through live here at, uh, from Danger Towers. This is yours truly, James Lockhart of the Danger Club podcast. And uh, well, we've got another very special edition of DMQs. Uh, now, of course, uh, DMQs without, uh, without DMs would just be Qs. And I'm sure we can all agree we've had enough of those. Thanks very much. So uh, I'm uh, going to introduce our first DM here. It is our very own Dungeon Master. Hello, um, hello everyone. Is this a DM? Is this an official DMQs then? Because I'm underprepared for. I mean, I'm I'm drinking, so that's a sign that it yep, might be yep. DMQs. That's that's always. I think it's an official DMQs. I mean, well, we're going to give it a try. Um, I mean, we have another DM here as a as a special bonus. Uh, it is our very own Ross. Ross. Hello. hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, oh, you can't hear me. Oh dear. Oh can't dear. You hear me. You can't let's, hear. Uh, let's try this very quickly. I'm mm. going to make sure that I'm connected on the right thing. We've been so good. Oh, at you've technology. muted yourself, James. Oh, I unmute. muted myself. Unmute that yourself. Might be the one. That is why. Let's unmute myself. James is on. Can mute. you hear me now? <laughs> Am oh. I live? This is fantastic. In which it's case, delay? Because there's a slight delay on the stream. Hooray! Yes. Hey, hooray. Also, in, in that case, you missed all of my introduction. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, we're here at DMQs. Apart from that slight technical hiccup, which is being uh, on mute, uh, we are here with uh, Danger Master, who you heard his introduction, but weirdly from the ether, as if it came from silence. And, of course, Ross. Uh, hello, really, everyone. <laughs> we'll just, just have that again. Now, we're really excited to be here. Uh, a couple of things. We're trying out a new medium, as you can see. So we're doing this through Discord, and you <laughs> should be able to follow our live stream to actually see our beautiful faces. And um, also, this is for you guys, our wonderful, beautiful Dangerlings. So if you've got any questions or any comments, or you just want to shout out, do so on the Discord. We shall hear you and respond to you in real time. Uh, but I think moving on, um, how have you been, Dan? What's, what have you been up to? Doing all right. It's nice to try something new on this because we kind of figured we've done a couple of Facebook Lives um, and we sort of realized it's only you guys who are tuning into the Facebook Lives. So why don't we just try and do it here on Discord um, to do it? And we need to uh, practice using Discord we do. Uh, because uh, we are going to be doing a live show at PaizoCon in a oh! couple of weeks. Oh! There we go. Bombshell just, for you just... people who got in that early. And we are going to be doing some major news there. Uh, there you, go. you got some details of that, Dan? That's how we're doing it in the, in the how are you. Um, yeah. So I, I heard that from Paizo today. I, I sort of said I was we're trying to sort it out. They can't hear me either. Can't hear Dan. The video is working. So uh, I, some people can hear me. Some people cannot. If you click on the stream, that's not going to help if you can't hear me, me explaining that. Yes. So if, um, if you're not hearing anyone and if you're only hearing my voice, then click on the stream and that will broadcast what's happening on the Zoom. So the way we've done this is that we're currently through Zoom and then I am streaming that to you, our wonderful links. So if you join the stream, you should be able to see our faces and uh, then not just my voice. Otherwise, this is going to be the queue in DMQs. Uh, <laughs> and that would be a little lame. Uh, so Dan, that, that little, uh, that little uh, technical update has rather overshadowed. What an announcement. What, what are the details of that? It's pretty good, isn't it? Right. So PaizoCon this year, um, understandably, uh, is going to be is an online convention. They're not having an actual physical convention. But that means it's something that everyone can go to. It's something everyone can be a part of. Uh, and part of that is going to be on, uh, on one of the evenings. It's not confirmed exactly when yet we've asked for a time slot we'll wait and see um, and i need to finalize the details with them but on one of them there is going to be a live show of the danger club podcast so you're going to be able to tune in very much like this to a live stream on discord uh, it'll be on one of their dis on one of paizo's discord servers uh, and you'll be able to see us at uh, the danger club playing the next version of um, the, the next set of Lockdown Legends. Uh, so the ones that will be airing on the podcast after we've finished this current series. Um, so you will actually get to hear a few of the episodes early. You'll get to hear a couple of the episodes from, next, You're from welcome. the next series of it before uh, this series is finished. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, that's so yeah, we figured exciting. we had to learn Discord quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to do that. But we did it in like about an hour. That was pretty good. Hour, oh, give or take half an hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that was doing very well. And and how have you been, Dan? How have you been as a person? I know that you've been doing some uh, streaming uh, sort of over the weeks, but uh, 
you you doing good i'm doing all right yeah it, it's kind of i think it's hit everyone this uh, this sort of seventh or is it eighth week of the lockdown here in Who here in knows? london and it's just kind of like <laughs> everyone's kind of crashed through that thing of like okay that's as much time as i can handle being stuck indoors and we've all gone uh you know all gone a bit peculiar from being stuck in but i've enjoyed some things i've really been enjoying doing these wednesday streams um i think well the last one was wednesday stream i think the one before was a different day but like where we've just hung out and chatted uh, and we've answered some questions and we've we've made a we've made basco mops um yes. yeah and we've just done some fun stuff and it's been really nice to just because we spend so much time like producing danger club as a as a thing um like the lockdown has been a really nice time to just hang out and get to know the dangerlings and get to know um all of you guys mm -hmm. I see Steph can't make it. Steph's in a meeting. Don't, oh, this, don't worry, Steph. We have, um, she yes. won't be in here, so she won't hear this. But we are oh. going to record this. We'll, we'll put it up on YouTube. Or yes, yes. Do, do, don't worry, Danger Links, if you can't make it or if you're catching up uh, at another time, good whenever. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, we are recording this. You'll be able to listen to it. And uh, Ross, how have you been doing? What have you been up to? You had, we had some player questions last week. And uh, yeah. how are you? Um, yeah, how have you been? Yeah, been good. Um, yeah, I've moved back home, so that's interesting. You revert to being a teenager when you go back home. Uh, you feel, even though I'm 31, uh, that's fun. Um, been playing a lot of Sea of Thieves with one of the Dangerlings. You have to guess who it is. Um, and yeah, just been playing games, watching films, watching Disney Plus. Just really boring stuff like that. But it's been fun. Is that, can we take it from your comment then, that that is what being a teenager is for you? Yes, of course. The, the clean version. Yes, the, just, of course, the clean version. Of course, There's the clean version. nothing else you would ever do Absolutely not. No, no. You've, um, been, you've been washing dishes with your mother. There's been <laughs> bluebirds just tweeting through the kitchen. It's all yeah. been very, very twee. She did, um, she did cut my hair today. So, well, yesterday, Good. actually. And I literally look like um, Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber uh, with a bowl <laughs> around my head. Um, so I've had to had to like gel it up a little bit so it doesn't look so stupid. But yeah, it's retro, maybe. Yeah, yeah, we love it's it. It's a lockdown it. haircut, so you know. Lockdown uh, haircut. I mean, uh, you consider yourself lucky. I've, I'm sporting a, an enormous Beethoven esque moth at the moment <laughs> uh, on top of my head. So uh, yeah, yeah, the struggle is real. Um, but speaking of the lockdown, I mean, we don't want to dwell on it too much because this is all fun and games and you know, we're here to distract and to entertain. Um, but it's really, we've been doing a lot of gaming uh, online, as I'm sure a lot of people have because we can't meet up in person. Um, a question for you, Dungeon Masters. We've been mm -hmm. using a few resources that you probably normally wouldn't. Um, I mean, for instance, name dropping, Roll20 is something we've been using. And uh, well, Dan, do you want to kick us off? How... How have you found that's changed the dynamic of games? And how has it changed your opinion of these systems? I love you name dropping Roll20 like your buddies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is, yeah. Um, it, it's very different. I, we've, we've all been learning different ways uh, of gaming. Uh, and for, like, for those of you who, who don't know, Ross GMs for us off air when we, um, when we don't, if we're playing games. Uh, off air a lot of the time um so his uh, knows um this sort of stuff really well but it, yeah so we switched to roll 24 social games we don't use it for the podcast if you've been listening to lockdown legends um you'll know that we don't um i don't know if you will know because i don't remember if we said it but yeah we're not using any kind of virtual tabletop for that we're just on um we're just recording a call together so we're just uh, got audio and video so we're just chatting because that's how we always do all of this stuff you know it's always theater of the mind and we had this idea a bit like why we don't use maps in the main podcast is we had this idea that you know if we've got a roll 20 board in front of us we're moving around then it's very easy for us to not explain what other people are seeing um and so if we figure if we have to absolutely describe everything that's going on then you will understand um you'll get a visual of it um to see i had an interesting thing um, this week, actually, I, I guessed it on Power Word Roll, um, which is another D&D podcast, which is, I think their episode's coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, the one I did with them, or the couple of episodes I did with them. And that was really fun. But the weird thing was they had a virtual tabletop, but I wasn't on it. I was just on the video, on the voice call. So they were moving around on a map, but I couldn't see where they were moving around. So it kind of forced them in the moment to kind of be a bit more descriptive on stuff, which is good. 
Well, um, that's exactly exactly what you're saying, isn't it? That yeah, w- yeah. when it's the, you know the theatre of the mind. Do you but, find though? Because I, I know you mm. are not keen on maps. You have never used them in our our sort of social games over the years. Have you changed your opinion? Is there are there situations where you think a map is good? Uh, yeah, Starfinder. Uh, my goodness, you need maps for Starfinder. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> yeah. it's sort of weird because uh, it depends on the mechanics of it and uh, and which mechanics you choose to use. I think um, I, th- I think with Pathfinder it's a little easier because and and with fantasy in general it can be a little easier because where are your standing specifically you don't need it um, and like where when I ran the Weeby Goblins game that um, uh, that we talked about on last week's stream I didn't use a map for that because I was playing with kids and I'm just like I'm not going to try and explain all of that let's just let's do it all. That's due to use imagination. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to, like, for example, at the moment, off air, we're playing against the Iron Throne um, with a few of us um, from from the podcast and and, and some mates, and um, and technically Ross, Ross hasn't played in like it, Ross, you, you haven't played in weeks, and yet your character still has his own theme. Oh yeah, maybe which I'll plays I'll whenever we mention you. He does. He does. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I've become a big fan of Roll20. I, I've used it for years pl- as a player because um, I play in a Kingmaker campaign with some old buddies from university that has been going for years and years. Uh, and we kind of, it's one of these ones where we meet up every two, three months and we'll play a whole day of Kingmaker. Um, and that, the my friend who GMs on that, shout out to Paul. Um, he's never been on our discord he doesn't know um <laughs> but he does like he knows how to do all the handouts he's talked us through how to do uh, character sheets in roll 20 which are amazing if you can get the character sheets in roll 20 working they, they you can click on a stat and it rolls all of your uh, rolls all your, your damage and rolls everything for you but you need to really get your head around macros and how all of the different key commands and things work like it's a lot of setup mm. uh, and it's not something i would want to have to explain to players unless i was really comfortable but in okay. terms of the maps it's really nice and for starfinder you really need it because everything's really ranged um so range is a really important movement is really important um and it depends the kind of thing you're running aeon throne is much more of a um is much more of a combat simulator uh, so it, it's much more of a tactical thing so the game element is a lot more important there okay. are th- downsides to it um i i think that um like for example uh i, I it, it makes it much more of a game uh, and for me that lays bare certain things like some games that you would previously play as mostly role-playing games like the way we play danger club i don't think would work on roll 20 because Mm. we have multiple episodes in a row where we don't roll a die you know or where it's all about character and that Mm. can be harder to do with a map sitting in front of you once you have a map you disassociate yourself from from the character a bit and you play a bit more like a game Um, and that starts to really lay the mechanics a bit bare yeah. Uh, like, like I found that I sort of stopped enjoying playing 5e when we started playing it and roll 20 and when we started playing it with a map because it's like, because then you're just dealing with the mechanics of it. And it's kind of like, I was like, oh, I, you know, I've never minded 5e when it's around a table and we're all just hanging out and playing the game. And then suddenly when it's like, oh, I have to really think strategically about that. Um, I, I lost interest. Well, that's, that's an interesting point, actually, because uh, drawing on to, to you, Ross, obviously the same question, um, you ran that. 5e campaign and uh you know obviously how have you found the transition to purely map based rather than just a a resource used every now and then um yeah it's an interesting one i find some ways it's easier some ways it's easy as a new dm to like use and uh as a useful tool uh but then i'm similar to dan in that thing is like it becomes a little bit more like a game Mm. um whereas I think you rely, when you use Roll20, sometimes you can rely too much on, you don't really need to explain what the characters see because they can see it on the on the screen, or they can right. see it on the map, you know? Uh, whereas if you were in a pub, if we were in all in a pub together, I, I would have to explain the, the surroundings and explain things. Um, and then I would, ha- like, as near the end of like when we were playing in a pub together Mm -hmm. i would have just like a little map um a little map book and i just put i just put wherever people were just because it's helped me see in combat but that's the only time that i would ever use it is in combat i wouldn't use it 
most of the time, like for anything else. Um, well, actually, that's, that's quite an interesting point because we tend to look at these resources, maps and tokens and such as a player resource. But you raised the interesting point that actually it might be more, more useful for a DM to have that available and then describe it. So the players are saying, saying what Dan mentioned, the, the theatre of the mind, but yeah. you're actually able to physically describe uh, sort of things. Do, do you think that would be a, a sort of a useful way around? Yeah, I think probably that's in if we do stuff in the future that will probably be how i will do it i will have the map in front of me so that i can see it and i will explain to you guys what you see and then if we're in a combat all i'd use is a, just a, a just a grid so that you would you can tell where you're going because i'm not very good at explaining where where you are is situated in that area or or where you where you could go possibly so i think it would be easier for me if i had a little grid for the map for the combat to find out where the enemy is and where you are mm -hmm. uh, and then and then just have the the description of what the place is in front of me yeah. when we're when we're back all together obviously at the moment it's hard so the another thing that's a bit annoying about roll 20 is the whole um like revealing stuff because it's quite hard to show show like areas that are secret without like spoiling it and stuff like that are, are you still I, using dynamic lighting ross for no for no i i did have the because you can get uh for the danger links you can get a paid version of roll 20 and that's got dynamic lighting but i i spent like an half an hour before the game with dan trying to work out how to do dynamic lighting on roll 20 and it did not work so i was like yeah i'll just cancel that subscription and just go free yeah for, I, I sort of use a like digital version of the old putting bits of craft paper over your map where I just I'll, before we move yeah. to the map I'll just draw loads of square loads of coloured in boxes over sections of the map and as you open doors and things I just delete them uh, and just reveal it like kind of kind of That's, old school sort I'll of stuff you, I'll I'll old school yeah I'll tell you what is really good though because I um I played a five E game with my mates from uni and um they've all got um uh beyond uh what is it called uh D &D beyond yes dnd beyond they've yeah. got like dnd beyond like account and um they you can use that through roll 20 so you don't like dancers you don't have to roll like as long as you've got the pop-up of your character sheet on uh dnd beyond you just press whatever role you need to do on that character sheet and it goes straight over to roll 20 which oh, is nice. so much easier and that makes combat nice. so much because they're all like you say roll roll to hit with your axe or whatever mm -hmm. um you uh you hit you click that it'll go over to roll 20 it'll mm -hmm. do the hit dice and then it'll also do the damage dice as well so nice. that you don't have to like it it yeah it's really useful if i was if i if i was to like if we were to carry on i would export people's character sheets to that D, &D beyond and then use that because it's a lot easier imagine i think I build it in yeah I mean, yeah <laughs> i think yeah because we're obviously just um referencing the chat we're getting quite a lot of good comments from people about mm. uh, the dynamic lighting Stu, hey Stu, uh he uses dynamic lighting as a dm Stu, um is, uh, uh, D. Uh, and uh, Alakar makes a point that trying it yourself usually isn't worth the effort. I think that, you know, Roll20, this is not this is going to become a Roll20 sort of uh, review, um, but it seems like a really, really good program. There's lots there, but it's not the most user friendly. So I think that combining it with, as you say, things like D&D Beyond and other things to export yeah. might be the way forward. Um, actually, we had a question from Stu, uh, sort of coming in, and I think this is quite a a good question. He asked what qualities are needed to make a good DM. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'll, I'll make it sort of slightly more personal. What do you feel are the qualities that, that make a good DM? I'm going to put this to Ross first. Mm. Um, I think to roll, like to roll with anything um, and to keep your, always find hooks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Candice has said, uh, to do funny voices uh yeah as well um i like doing that i do i like you know introducing some comedy because i find that the strongest bits in my games are the bits where i haven't really planned and it will lead us into talking about adventure paths later but um yeah like 
I find uh, the ability to, you know, go off piste, the ability to improvise, um, okay, to do so- funny voices and to keep people. The thing is you want to, you want to, you want to, f- I think you want to, you know, go with that balance of funny, funny, and also engaging for the players in terms of like drama or whatever, yeah. whatever angle you're going with. Yeah. And yeah. I'm a firm believer if you can make someone laugh, then you've kind of got them in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And, and Dan, how do you, what, what colleagues do you think really lend themselves to a, a good DM? I think, hang on, I'm going to try to send a heart to Stu because he actually waved at us when he sang his name. And <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> I think you, a, a massive part of being the GM of campaign is that you are the one who has to keep it going. Mm-hmm. Um, it means you have to be the you have to be the most dedicated to the campaign, and yet you have to be the least precious about it. Um, so it's it's your job to keep those people coming to the table and having fun every single session. Uh, and and people underestimate kind of how important that role is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can get lost in this. You know, you can create the most incredible Tolkien-esque world. Um, with the massive lore and books and books of backstory and everything. But if your players aren't enjoying turning up or if you're missing game sessions, then you haven't got a game there. And as soon as it, see, as soon as it stops being regular, then you don't have a campaign. As soon as people start thinking, oh, you know, will it happen or won't it happen this week? Uh, I guess maybe I won't. You know, because there's a lot of other things to do and people are busy. Um, yeah. So you have to be the one who's prepared to, you know, if, you're, if you've got a game every week, you turn up every week ready to run that game. And, and, you know, and I've had sessions where I've run for eight people and I've had sessions where I've run for two people and I've had sessions where I've turned up and no one's arrived because stuff happened and life got in the way and that, you know, and that happens. But you have to be the one who's there who is picking that up and when your players aren't enjoying themselves, you're having the conversations with them and you're, you're, helping, them to, you're helping them to that or helping them take breaks or, yeah. or how it works. You know, you're sustaining that. But on the flip side, you're also the person who has to completely throw out your favorite thing about the campaign because it suddenly turned out that your players aren't digging it, you know, because you have this, uh, you know, you have this whole thing planned out. You have a whole arc um, planned out, you know, and we've had it in campaigns. I don't know if we've ever necessarily, some of it's happened in Danger Club. It happens a lot in Danger Club with sort of NPCs where you're like, I really love this NPC, but it, it's time for them to go because they're not a player character and they've been, you know, they've served their point in this and it's getting self-indulgent. That will never happen when Captain Gumbo, um, he's my, <laughs> my green child, um, oh, will be around long after a, you've all got sick that of That is him. a small <laughs> goblin-shaped hill that you will die on. Um, <laughs> but, but interestingly, obviously you, you, you say these, uh, the sort of the, uh, the, the challenges. How have you found that they've altered or changed during the lockdown? Like, has it become easier in some ways, but harder in others? Um, you have to get very, very good at the sort of the GM. I don't know if you found this, Ross, um, or anyone else who, who GMs a lot um, on Roll20. You have to get very good at the GM waffle while you're on a different page creating a map <laughs> for the thing that the players have decided to go and do. Yeah. Like, I very quickly created a Starship hijack um, map the other day um, because... Um, James and Candice decided they were going to go and steal some detonators from parked freighter. And I'm just like, just doing a sort of NPC voice being like, of course, this is a very dangerous mission while you're doing, <laughs> while I'm on just another thing, just frantically like building a map and putting yeah. characters on. Wh- whilst throwing quite complicated questions at you as well about a, a job <laughs> we're about to do. And, uh, and, and, and Ross, well, same question for you. What have you found it's... Sometimes, what? you know, uh, I, yeah, like um, when you're at the pub, uh, sometimes I would take the the adventure path book into the into the toilet with me as a little, <laughs> uh, just sneak Those off and just quiet, have <laughs> quite tender moments as a DM. Just gonna... I don't know why I didn't just do it in front of you, but like uh, in this, it's a lot. It's kind of a bit easier. Like, but you do get distracted. Like I was looking at notes because obviously it depends on what your setup is as well. Uh, if you've got a big desk, which Dan does now. Um, but like, if you haven't got a big desk, you've like, you've got to like go, Oh, hold on. Um, and there was a moment the other Monday where, uh, one of the characters was talking to me, uh, one of the NPCs and I was just ignoring him, just looking at something on the, in the adventure path. And he was just <laughs> going, so, um, so hello. Hello. Um, just and it it came out as a role play thing that it, it, the guy was just ignoring him, um, which was quite funny. But yeah, it, there is like it depends on your setup. I think at home, like 
how much space you have mm. and how much you can like lay out. Cause I used to have two screens. Now I've only got one and like, yeah, it's all dependent on that. I think. Yeah. And, and in terms of some of the more sort of, um, esoteric kind of side of things so actually sitting around a table in a pub um that's a different dynamic to sitting in your chair at home with everyone on on the screen how mm. have you have you found that's changed the dynamic of being a dm for you who's that to um, me or uh, i think i think just either one of you wants to chime in a little it's um i think it made recording danger Club a little bit different although i think we were quite pleased with how it came out i, I think yeah. some of you guys probably listened to lockdown legends by now i i hope you're enjoying it um we were you know i was so worried when it came out i was like what is this going to be like is it going to be totally not, not necessarily from the tech point of view um but from you know velda's awful um and, <laughs> you know, every, He's the worst uh, character. Yes, yes. No, it was just yeah. like I was just like it's so different to how we normally record. And are we going to vibe off each other? Are we going to have anything? And then as soon as it starts coming in, um, and it, you know, thank you everyone. Um, I'm glad you're you're enjoying it. My goodness, Monday's episode is insane. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's one of the weirdest ones we've ever done. Um, but yeah, it does. It changes it a bit. Um, but it's it's quite nice for it's quite nice for doing what we're doing with playing Starfinder because we're effectively learning a game together. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that sort of one, the GM is less aloof. The GM's there with the players and you're all looking at rules together and you're, you're basically playing, playing the adventure path rather than playing each other yeah. um, to an extent. So it's a slightly different dynamic in that regard, I guess. Um, and, I th um, what about you, Ross? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I was going to say like, it, I think sometimes like, um it can be to the detriment like you know playing online like some people don't enjoy it i've had a few people drop out of monday's games because it's not like like dan says um if people don't like you know playing it, it may feel like a bit of a game a video game do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and some people might not like that and that may not have happened had we been in a pub do you know what i mean uh all together and there may have been a different feeling and some people and you know some people in the group don't like roll 20 and things like that and it, you always you always you always got to try and combat certain things uh, which is fine like you know it's nothing against uh, any of that uh, even though i hate dan but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I for the that. live stream guys it's, there we it's are. fair no, yeah this no, is joking. this is where it's all going to come out this is our uh, <laughs> no, no, um, this is our john and uh, John and Paul bust up. No, it's um, <laughs> no, it, it's important does actually. Make, for, does that make me yo? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Roll twenty is Yoko. It, 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 <laughs> it's important to remember anyone who is GMing games at the moment is how, and I know we hear this so many times. It's how unique a situation the current time is and the current climate is, and how that is affecting people in different ways, and people are dealing with it in their own sort of yeah. ways, and so you have to have a little bit more understanding where sometimes if someone says you know what i'm not playing today and that's fine because if yeah. you're not in that headspace then that's then you shouldn't play um yeah. you know you should do what you need to do to get through the day and sometimes that's playing loads and sometimes that's taking a step back and doing something else yeah um, the, the know, core of all... it you want everyone to enjoy it you know you want yeah. people everyone to around the table to enjoy it and if they are enjoying it then yeah you just have to you have to leave it to that person to decide what they find enjoyable what yeah. they you know enjoy yeah. and, I, and i think like dan says it, it can change from day to day we live we live in strange times this is known and exactly. um, yeah i think everyone yeah. rather if you had a well i suppose an interesting question um if you had a player would you rather a player came to your table even though they weren't enjoying the game or if they just stayed away even if it meant there weren't that many players sat at the table what what's your opinion as a dm uh let's have ross i would I honestly would leave it up to them, like, mm -hmm. uh, especially because you're all my mates and whoever would join my table, I'd be mates with. And it's up to them. Like at the core of it, I want them to be happy. I can, I can throw them things in, in, if they're saying they're not like feeling invested, maybe I could mm -hmm. throw them things in there about their backstory and like things that may be able to entice them into the story or whatever. But at the core of it, if they're not happy, it depends on, 
you know, you can talk to them about what is the reason as to why they're not happy. And if it's the core of the game or whatever, then there's nothing really we can do about that. And like, do you know what I mean? That yeah. sort of, that sort of ilk. Um, I know what you mean. And, and Dan, what, what, what do you feel? Do you, saying, do you know what I mean? Like this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's because I mean, you're, yeah. you're back at home now and you're, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're back in the hood. Mm. Um, that's hip hop, folks. Uh, <laughs> right. Hip hop talk. <laughs> hip hop talk. And uh, Dan, what would you uh, what would you say to that? Would you? Would yeah, you... I I mean, I I would always rather people do what makes them happy. You know, I'm mm. I've never in that kind of frame of mind of being like, no, my game is the best thing you could possibly do, and you must be spending time um, doing it. And, and that goes for, you know, even for the podcast, which is you know more of a, a work thing. Mm. It, you know, if people wanted to take a break from it then we could and we you know we, we we discussed it with drum when he was having um his second kid and we were like do you want to take a sabbatical and come back later on um mm-hmm. and he said no he wants he wants to keep doing it uh, and obviously he's missed the velder episodes because of um other stuff that's gone on but um but he's he's still in in the show and it was um, totally fine like it's you know, absolutely like fine and you can always, yeah. and you can you can t- people can come and go in different ways like somebody missing somebody not digging it at the moment doesn't mean that they're gone forever it doesn't mean you have to you can write them out if they're like oh i want a big exit fine give them that if you want to use it a story or you can come up with a thing their character leaves but maybe they come back but it's fine to have a character just not show up for a bit like people aren't there people aren't at the game to care about what other people's characters are doing all yeah. the time as much you know people will be quite happy if you're just like oh this this character didn't show up today um and we move on with the adventure yeah uh, and that's fine you know you can that that fits in the story as well but yeah i would always rather people do what is right for them but you that's yeah. where you talk to each other you you yes yeah, what gms and players do they talk yeah to yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's interesting to find out the different challenges that people are facing. Alakar has chimed in on the chat that um, he, he's found it's much harder to stay focused when you're not at a table together. Mm. Um, and that's yeah. one of the biggest hurdles that, that he's faced moving his 5e game to roll 20. And I think it just changed a lot of those dynamics, like you say, talking and just, just being sat in a pub. Um, th- yeah, because you're actually in front of everyone and you're mm. actually, you actually are experiencing it in front. Whereas like, you're you're not there you're not actually in this room with me you're on the on the other side of a webcam in your own house like um which is a hard one yeah it is it is and actually uh, another comment that was made by um earlier on the chat um by rob um Mm. uh, he asked how do you guys do roll up that do rolling without roll 20 do you just go on trust with physical dice well that's an interesting point we're not sat in a pub together would you trust each other to roll and be honest. That's how we did it yes. for the uh, Velder episodes, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, it's because it you, you guys know that old Bad Moon is going to roll 20s. So oh, you, know, you, <laughs> you don't need to see that. Bloody hell. Oh, yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> 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 I, you know yeah we do we do it on trust um and you can have your own dice rolling out that's that's fine you can and like if you're playing with people you don't know maybe you want to do that more but with between mates i don't think it's, um, to do I, it. think, um I think river goes heading out see you buddy thanks for joining us ah. um yes exactly and I, and I think you've got to uh well alakar said i have a rule where i won't run a game for people i wouldn't trust to roll their own dice and that's i think that's brilliant. i think that's the case that's just about what i was going to say that yeah. if they're sat at your table then you know there's an element of trust there there's an yeah. element of uh, sort of enjoyment and who wants to cheat what's the mm, what's the yeah. fun in that i've got a question about adventure because I, I, I want to talk oh, about yes. like Ro- i want to know about ross's adventure prep method later <laughs> on like notes and stuff you take but i want to because we like it, it's obviously it's easy at the moment because we're, we're at home all the time i want to know what's the weirdest place you've ever prepped a dnd game um cool uh i don't really have any weird i uh, sort of maybe like um maybe in a park because i don't like when i read the adventure paths i a park yeah not now obviously because we're not allowed to go out <laughs> oh but, it's true yeah, yeah. yeah don't, don't hurt me don't hurt me um <laughs> uh but like before i don't really have any i usually do it at home or at work the day before like a like before the the evening like game um so i don't really have any weird places obviously it's weird i mean a pub toilet is probably one of the weirdest places to then plan (laughs) plan the next part of the adventure um yeah there's there's been games where i've had to think about them literally on the way to the pub um name naming one of them would be 
the adventure I had to do for two people, uh, Dan and James, where they had to go to a turtle island. Um, oh, that was the oh. most fun. Yeah. That was ridiculous. It was great. Yeah, and that was all made up literally an hour or two before. And I had to quickly do them uh, character sheets and they played totally different people. Um, yeah, it was mental. Uh, it was mental. And I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that was probably the weirdest place. Probably the, probably the pub toilet or on the tube or in a park. Yeah. All right. So back at you, Dan. Where's the weirdest place you prepped a game? I, so I used to work in, I still work in cabaret a bit. I mean, none of us work in cabaret at the moment. But, you know, I, I still do occasional bits. But I used to work in real late night cabaret um, in like fancy clubs. And I, I have had an evening where I've been like sat in this tiny changing room with just all of the dancers and everyone getting changed and just people in their pants just climbing around over each other to try and get a thing. And I'm sitting there with the fall of Plague Stone in my hands, like highlighting dressed, treasure. Dressed as what, Dan? I believe I was dressed as a cheerleader um, for that one. <laughs> uh, while I was highlighting up the, <laughs> the fall of Plague Stone. I'm just Give like, me a D. This, yeah, Give me I'm an A. Like, I, I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what my 14 year old self thinks of this version of me. I, in oh, many ways, yeah. I feel oh, like awesome. I've achieved my ultimate form. But there yeah. is, there is me and Dan work at that same place. And there is a room upstairs where you greet the guests uh, as a character. And it's, literally four walls of white like just white walls and it feels a bit like purgatory and so in there that's where i created there ain't no water in water deep if you haven't um if you haven't heard it go and listen to it uh, that's where i was singing there was a backing track in that room and uh, it was just like jazz and i was just singing to it out loud in this room as b in between the guests coming in it was very odd it's oh, yeah amazing. we've i mean we've all three of us have worked there and it is a, a strange strange place yeah um but that, that leads me on to a point that somebody else made earlier and we were talking about the qualities that make a good dm and uh and candice she mentioned the voices uh, now you've both said sort of things that you like doing that you think you're particularly good at how do you find it because i think there is a pressure i'm sure a lot of other dms have felt it that every character that your that party meets kind of needs their own personality, even if it's just some bod that they're randomly on the street or a MacGuffin or, or an important character. How do you keep that creativity flowing for yourself? Uh, let's go for Dan first. Uh, you do the first voice that pops into your head and you hope like hell it isn't one you've done before. And then you try and remember. <laughs> I have NPCs sometimes where I've forgotten what their voice is while doing them. Like in the time it takes one of you to ask the question, I'm forgotten what their accent was and i'd be like oh no <laughs> um sometimes you plan it in advance if you if it's an npc heavy game uh then you might like i've got here you go for the camera this is one of my favorite modules um through it's, it's gonna be reversed isn't it but this oh, is hangman's noose that was great hangman's noose reversed. is one of my favorite pathfinder it's actually a 3.5 adventure um, but it's a it's a murder mystery adventure uh, and so a big part of the game is uh, all of these NPCs, all this this jury who are slowly getting killed off while you try and solve the mystery. And so you want all of them. And the module really stresses, gives them all character traits uh, and uh, gives them uh, stuff to remember on it. So if I'm doing that, I'll make a list of all of the NPCs. I'll give all of them an accent uh, or a voice. I'll give them a couple of character traits, uh, a couple of personality traits. I'll print off all of the pictures of them on there so I can have them all on the table and I can put a big red cross through them all as they get killed off. Um, and, and the same if you're going into a, uh, a town where, you know, like when we did Plague Stone, um, I made a list of all of the Fall of Plague Stone residents as I was sitting in a cabaret changing room and, um, and gave all of them like, just, I was like, here's a ballpark idea of what their voice took. They're like, they're, this person's got like a farmer voice. This person, give them a Bronxy kind of accent. Um, this person's kind of posh but old. Um, you know, that just something to kind of to hang it off. Uh, and then the rest of it, you just kind of try and make up as you go along. And also, you try and something I've sort of tried to do since doing the podcast as well is you you become a lot more conscious about the kind of accents that you use um, and the uh, like. I, I became I'm I'm slightly uncomfortable looking back with the skulks um, from. Uh, from Murder's Mark when we were doing them because they all sound a little bit like Robin Williams doing his bizarre um, seller, like his, his merchant guy in Aladdin. Um, <laughs> 
which is, you know, which is for the guys who kind of live in trash and stab people. I was just kind of like, I'm not sure if I'm totally comfortable with that being the accent that goes with those, you know, is that maybe, um, so you try and be a little bit, I'm trying to be a bit more sort of varied and not always. And also, cause you, you can, if you do stuff all the time, it's very easy to get into a thing where you're like, this is my bad person voice. And you, someone yeah. talks in and like starts talking, you know, if you have a female character who's like, hello boys, everyone's just like, oh, right. Okay. That's, she's going to turn on us. So we, we yeah, just kill yeah. her now. Um, you yeah, know, so you try and change it up with that as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and Ross, I mean, you've come up with some phenomenal characterizations in your time, some really King of uh, off, off the wall voices. Yeah, it's, it's one of your fortes. And how do you keep that creativity going? Uh, I just move my mouth in a different way and go, OK, that's how that person's going to talk. Like some of the I get. I, get, I thought it's going to be a really sucky answer. Yeah. Well, you know, I just moved my mouth, James. No, but like, uh, as in, like, okay, he's got a shake like this, like he's got no, like, bottom jaw, like, or something like that. And that's sort of how I go with that. Um, I am tending now to like go. Oh, this is oh, this is just a this is just a female voice. This this kind of this guy sounds exactly like the other guy that I just did. Or like all my old people sound like David Attenborough because that's my go to like <laughs> thing. And I'm like, oh no, I need to sound. It's hard to like, especially when it's like really um, quick. You've got to be really quick uh, in terms of like the person going, "Oh, excuse me, what's your name?" Like, like I do to Dan. Yeah. Um, and to do that, have that done on me, I'm like, "Oh, um, hello." Uh, and the hardest thing for me is coming up with names. I always call them the same names all the time. It's either Barry, Larry. Uh, or like some really generic, never fantasy names, <laughs> never ever fantasy, never really mundane, boring names like Barry. <laughs> we, we are the two worst GMs for following that piece of advice of having a list of fantasy names yeah. on your GM yeah. screen. I've got one in, oh, yeah. in this book thing that I've got, but I never use it. I just go, oh, Barry, that's my name, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's interesting because I mean, Alicard's just chipped in with the, he always helps to know how many voices you can do before you start so that you don't do the same one back to back. Um, which is, yeah, that's a very good, good comment. And um, obviously for you guys, you both mentioned different methods there. So you've got, you know, the, the preparation side where you know you're going to have these 12 characters and then you've got, as Ross mentioned, just the off the cuff. I mean, is it tempting to say that the off the cuff ones are sometimes the best because you don't have time to plan them? What would be your comment on that? Yeah, I think so. I think you get the best uh, out of them and you get the weirdest, yeah, because you've got to go with whatever comes out of your voice yes. and also name as well. Uh, we've had some of the like, the, yeah, we've had some of the funniest times uh, in my game and in, in, Dan, in Dan's oh. game. Yeah, I, where... I, I loved your eagle. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was one of the best eagle voices. It was literally, if eagles could talk, they'd talk like that. And you just came out with it straight away. And I was like, oh, look at that. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, I would say that. I would say it's... I prefer doing it off the cuff. Like, obviously, there's good to go, okay, maybe this person's like South African or maybe this person's like, you know, Scottish or something like that in your mm -hmm. head, but then maybe change it, yeah. I found that it works for me to just do it off the cuff. Just do it off the cuff, yeah, just yeah. go with that inspiration. And, and Dan, what about you? Have you found that some of your best voices have just come, boof, just straight up? They, they can do because it's actually quite a good sort of version of a caricature. Like, if somebody says, you're talking to a fish person, go. And you know, you just immediately something just comes out, and you're like, "Oh, well, I guess that's that." In my head, that's what I've always imagined a fish person talks like. <laughs> um, you know, and and because you're all having that shared moment together, you all have that kind of. Well, of course, that's what a fish person talks like. Yeah. Um, so that can be that can be quite helpful, and it's much easier with ridiculous stuff than it is with um, with just random people in the street. It's true, and yeah. and just I have to ask, um, Ross, fish person, go. Hello, my happy person. Dan, fish person. Yeah, I think it was. It is really throaty, isn't it? It's that kind of. I mean, I think that's a great tip because that was a moment. So, for for anyone listening out there who who is a DM and who maybe struggles with this, I mean, I think that you know we're all performers in particular on this particular podcast, but a lot of people out there maybe don't have the experience, like Alakar says, they don't have that many voices, so. What would, be, uh, what would be a good tip uh, from you, Ross? I mean, you mentioned about changing a mouth shape. Would that be the tip you'd give to a, a DM starting out to try and vary up their voices? Yeah, maybe throw your voice in a different way than you would do. You know, place your voice in a different part of your 
uh, mouth. Uh, you know, put a cotton wool bud in your in the side of your mouth, like um, like you did in Godfather. Marlon Brando, um, yeah. yeah. Um, or you know, any 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 sort of thing. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily. You don't have to do voices to be engaging. You can no. you can always be you can be exactly the same uh, person, but as long as you engage your your players, then it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and if your players are invested in talking to that person and, um, you know, actually conversing, uh, you know, I don't think it really matters. But if you wanted to try different voices, then, yeah, try maybe different accents. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean you have to be good at that accent. It could be funny. Then that person could be re- it could be a really funny scene that that guy's trying to be Scottish or, you know, or whatever. Yeah. 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 And Dan, any, any tips that you've found over the years? Just have an idea of who the character is. I think even if it, and it can be, if it's a character that's come out of nowhere. Um, oh, hey, Steph, Steph's joining us. Um, if it's a character that's hey. come out of nowhere, that like, even if it's just somebody in the street and you're like, ah, oh, think of one thing about that character. And it can be as simple as they are trying to get to lunch and they don't want to talk to, they're really busy and they don't want to talk to mm. these people. That's going to give you, a, that's going to give you something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just start speaking and you'll get, you know, even if it's that you speak a bit quick, you speak a bit quicker because I want to get, what are you doing? Are you, are you holding me up? I want to get to lunch. I've got something to do, you know, or you, you, you're this paranoid. Oh, why you, you know, something like that that would just give you a little bit and you just start talking and something, something will come out. And it doesn't matter if it, if you stick with it and it doesn't matter if it's like, you're not, you're not going to try it. This isn't a self tape. Um, yeah. you know this yeah. is just having fun we are just, just yeah, we do what works yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it's lovely what ross said earlier as well as uh, don't put any pressure to do voices mm. um i think that you know it's it's fun to do if you're confident enough to do it and it can add a little bit of spice but yeah you're the dm play it your way i guess yeah i've had games where no one has done voices and they've been really good you know um and we're, we're just lucky because we're all actors and we do stupid voices on a daily basis. Um, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> um, so yeah, and also like it's quite good because uh, we've got to. <laughs> so well, we've got a social game and our podcast, so we can always trial voices in the uh, social games, which we have done. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah you should write stuff. How, do, how much prep do you do, Ross? Like, how much, how much pre-planning do you do for a session? Because uh, both of us, I think one of the things that makes us very similar, because Scott GMs as well, but he GM, GMs homebrew stuff all the time. Um, whereas I think the two of us run a pre-mades a lot. We run stuff out of books, uh, adventure paths or, or modules and things. Yeah. So how do you, what's your process for like turning a, uh, a bit of pre-written text into a, um, something you run at the table? Um, it's a bit easier at the moment because I've got, the uh, Roll20 Rise of Tiam um, pack that you can buy. So you get all the maps and oh, all nice. the, the things and the counters on that. Um, yeah, I'm run, running a 5e Rise of Tiam campaign at the moment. They're near the end. Um, I think I just read it a couple of days before, read the next section. I should, I mean, me being, I should read the whole thing, then then read each section, but I don't. I read each, I read each episode as they're going to do it and go, okay, this is what's going to happen. Um, uh, there are things that I had to like plan, like homebrew. There was a, there's a thing that happened with Drum's character where he killed a city guard in the middle of Baldur's Gate. Um, uh, he... <laughs> <laughs> he murdered him and they just got there as well. Um, Which yeah. Coming from Alakar saying, nobody really does that, Ross. Anyone who says they are, they've read the whole thing <laughs> is lying. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, true, I, yeah. possibly. possibly. Yeah. I'm looking at Dan. But, um, yeah. So I had to create this whole story. I had to homebrew a whole story about how this guard was, because legitimately, if you kill a city guard, you're probably going to be executed. Like they'll probably kill you. Um, so then I had to go, okay, well, I don't want him to die because that's harsh, but I also want to teach him a lesson. So I got his hand cut off and then I had to create this whole thing about that. He was on the payroll to this like underground, underground, like uh, uh, criminal organization. And the top, the, the icing on the cake for that one was he wasn't there for the entirety of that whole thing. <laughs> Um, so he did this thing and then came back right at the end and was like, Oh, what'd you do? What'd you do? 
<laughs> so and we're like yeah we got you off that coach oh jolly good right i forgot yeah. so like, like that took a lot of planning but like in terms of like yeah planning a pre-made i just read sort of a couple of days or a day before or and that day as well and go okay this room has this this room has that this room has this in it uh yeah that's how i do it because um it's a lot easier yeah um to read it the day before otherwise if i read it like the straight the monday after the the next game i wouldn't remember by the time it got to the next monday yeah that's fair yeah but i think um a little competition for the links uh answer on a postcard who that player was who uh <laughs> who mattered that city guard and then left for the next game um and uh, dan how much prep do you do you do oh you know well i I start by reading the whole module. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, in a cabaret. Uh, in a cabaret. Yeah. No, most of the time. Actually, most of the time. And, and you'll find a lot of Pathfinder modules are broken up into sections. So there'll be th- this sort of segments of the thing. So I'll, I'll, run, I'll read all of the segment that I know we're going to be playing. And then I'll read a little bit of the next one just so I know what's going on with it. I know where we're going next. So I know kind of what we can steer it to. But I, might, I won't necessarily read the entire section like when we do um master living when we did master living god i was like okay i'm gonna read up to the infiltration and so i know that they're gonna go to the town and they're gonna join the cult somehow and that's gonna be for the way we record that's gonna be a a day's worth of episodes so we don't i don't need to know the ins and outs of the exact routine of the cult and then you can be like okay um now i'm gonna learn the specifics of it yeah but i'll read as much as i can and then i will when it comes to running the actual sections, I will go through the module guide. Um, remember this? Master the living God. Um, nice. So I'll go through it. I'll print out. I'll always, because I have PDFs, most of it, and I run most, most things off PDF, most of the, uh, and I'll, uh, so I'll have a one note that is running that will have all of the stat blocks I need in it uh, and uh, a few like key notes that I have to remember. Sometimes character voices, things like yeah. that will go in there. I'll print off the maps. I'll, I'll note, you can't really see on this, but I'll, I'll annotate the maps with kind of what is, just some notes about exactly what is in these rooms. Sometimes I might write down DCs for like unlocking doors. I'll stick that on the map. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'll go through um, and I'll highlight. Um, no, miss it. There you go. Bit of highlighter in there. So I'll go through, I'll, I'll highlight um, skill checks in one color so i can find them quickly if i'm looking uh, in the book so i can look up a skill check uh, and i'll highlight treasure in another color and i'll usually highlight monsters in another color as well so I'm, i can look straight at the path the, at the panel and i know exactly what is in all of those things mm-hmm. um and then if we're doing for the podcast because we're mostly going to be doing 1e to 2e conversions then i'll go through and do all the conversion stuff so i'll change all of the I'll change all the money one increment down. I'll replace any items that don't exist in 2E. Um, I'll, I'll reskin um, some monsters. Like with masks, rather than trying to complete... Because the NPC creation rules weren't out at that point, the, um, the Game Mastery Guide, which I swear we will talk about on stream one day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that wasn't out when we had to run it. So rather than trying to completely rebuild all of the... Um, uh, all of the people that you fought and all the cultists um, and all the priests. Uh, I just went into the, uh, the Tui monster manual. Uh, to, monster manual? Goodness. I can tell I've been there. Five, one, the best tree. Um, and I found equivalent challenge rating creatures who were quite similar. Uh, and I changed them all out. So for like the priests were actually all Tengu, um, but they didn't have the pecking beak uh, ability. And the uh, the heralds were hobgoblin archers, I think, which is why Xanathar was so good with a crossbow. Um, so I just sort of reskinned all the monsters in it so that we had those versions. Yeah. Um, and so then, yeah, then I, then I run it out the one, and then I'll, then I'll get onto my lore stuff um, and I'll start reading and I'll, I'll read as much as I can. I'll go and do on the Pathfinder wiki and read as much as I can about the, the settlement where it's set, the town where it's set. So I can just throw in a few little extra details about the uh, about the world and uh, build law stuff so got a lot of prep there mm. uh, i'm a uh, nerd <laughs> no. well, i think it's a, it's an interesting point i that, deserve got, that i mean but you've, you've got the sort of uh like we said earlier about voices stuff that's going to be recorded for all time and then casual meetups in pub and yeah. then you're perhaps going to be based on uh, yeah oh yeah a, a, a on throne I'm reading the night before and I'm running out of the book pretty much. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. and I think from what you said earlier, if you over prep, um, you're setting yourself up for a little bit of heartbreak because will the players do what you want them to do? No, yeah. no, they're not going to do that. And all that prep would be mm. for naught. 
Um, now we are incredibly running short of time. It is. Uh, yeah, I know. This has been fifty-five minutes. This has flown by, guys. It's been great fun. Um, I suppose to close, I had another idea. I had an idea. So we've mentioned them out there, all the, the wonderful lings and all the danger, danging, danging masters <laughs> who might be uh, out the there. The danging masters. masters. The danging masters. Um, so. <laughs> Sorry, Stu. I think, well, if we, if we close with, uh, do you have, from all your distillation of knowledge, this week's top tip for den dungeon masters out there? And we'll go with Dan probably first. Let's have a top tip uh, that, that people can take forward for their games, be it writing stuff down or having a little screen or what, what, have, what have you found that's been really useful for you? Reskin everything. Um, we are going to do a stream at some point about making monsters because I really want you guys to make a monster for the guys to fight in um, when we do our next set of shows. Oh, I wish um, it was Halloween. I think oh, that'd be, be really so fun. Yeah. Halloween. Um, because I, uh, I think you guys will terrify them um, and that'd be great. But, you know, you don't always have to make a monster from scratch uh, and you don't always have to like explain why a monster from somewhere in the best tree is, is where you are. Find a monster that has the abilities you like and the skills that you like and just say it something else. Uh, change out like one special ability if you need it. You will save so much time by just doing that just don't slave over trying to uh, re trying to completely build monsters all of the time um, that would be my top tip for the moment nice good tip that's a really good tip and uh, ross what what tip would you have for new dungeon masters or dungeon my masters top tip for new dungeon masters is uh don't uh try not to get so sensitive uh about things about about worry and don't worry so much as long as your players are sitting around and they're having fun or they're engaged in what you're doing you're doing a very very good job um i do not listen to my own advice i <laughs> overthink and worry about everything uh, after every game i always message one person in the game and go was that good oh, i think nobody's enjoying it nobody's liking it nobody likes it um yep. but i would say Try not to worry and try not to overthink things. Um, don't worry if someone's looking at their phone one moment of the... Um... Exactly. Stu says, Hakuna Matata. He's wise, um, Stu. Stu yeah. is wise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, don't get worried if someone's looking at their phone for, like, one moment. Uh, as long as they're enjoying it and they're spending time, it doesn't matter. I think that's so, I think it's a, a lovely message, especially in these times where you know people are going to be a little bit more stressed and, and worried about things. And and as we mentioned earlier, you're not physically in their presence. So yeah. to you, someone's checking their phone. Whereas if you're in the pub, you'd be able to see that actually they'd look at the spell list or something like that. But yeah, very wise words. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this has been a, a phenomenal uh, uh, DMQs. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, any last uh, any last comments from you, you two boys? Um, stay safe. Yep. Stay alert. <laughs> Good. Good. Th thank you, Boris. And uh, <laughs> I meant really more about, uh, you know, just sort of uh, what you're going to be doing. Any plans for the future? And, and Dan, uh, any, any wise words from you? Well, I was going to say, oh, all right. Well, uh, if oh, well no, say, no, if sorry. You... Sorry, we're going back to number 10. <laughs> well, if you're going to uh, say uh, what we're going to do. Um, all right. So after the rise of team, I think, depending on what everyone wants to do in terms of our social game, I'm either going to... Uh, suggest maybe doing a 5e version of a cyberpunk game or another game where you play woodland creatures um or another game of greek mythology 5e or an alien uh, rpg game so we will see where we are after nice. um because i think the guys will finish the social game in lockdown so we'll see what happens after that mm, nice and and uh, dan any what, what are you going to be up to uh, I'm mostly uh, hard at work converting the Danger Club podcast to Pony Finder first edition rules uh, for when we make that transition after lockdown and everyone plays um, pink horses for the rest oh, of it. Yeah. So that, I will, mean, I that think will keep me quite busy. I definitely know drum move down with that. Uh, I think we're very <laughs> excited. And actually, um, speaking of uh, earlier on, Stu said, do I DM? And uh, what, if not, why not? Uh, I probably would. Uh, if I did, I'd quite do a Shadowrun campaign or something like that. I, I do love a little bit of cyberpunk, so watch this space. Ooh. But uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, this has been so much fun. And thank you, all the Danger Links, who've been on the chat for us. Uh, there's not been many, but you've been 
phenomenal in your response as ever. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Ross. Thank you. I Go thank to you, work. Dan. <laughs> Cheers, James. Thanks for keeping us on track for this one because we well, do ramble. Well, we ramble, but then again, we do love to talk. So, uh, so this has been us, the Danger Club, as is doing DMQs from Danger Towers as much as we can. Uh, thank you so much. Do check out this week's podcast episode if you haven't already. And we've got so many more coming up uh, that are going to knock your socks off. Uh, but for now, I think uh, keep safe and play dangerous. And we'll see you soon. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.